workshop, I would like to invite Congresswoman Underwood back to the stage. Oh my gosh, you guys. Okay, so for those of you who came to our first uh, Black Maternal Health Summit back in 2019, we just recreated what we did that first time, right? When we had the round table, we heard from all the experts from around the country. That's literally how we came up with the Momnibus. Jack will tell you, he just put it in a spreadsheet, we sorted that bad boy, pulled out keywords, and that became the original nine bills. So when you hear us say, we are looking forward to Momnibus 2 and we want to hear from you, this is where we get the ideas. I was sitting right there in the front row, taking notes, putting stars. Y'all were so specific with these, this feedback and these ideas, and I want to sincerely say thank you. Stay tuned, because we are working on something very exciting to come with Momnibus 2. But we can't get there until we pass the Momnibus. And so, you know, I appreciate um, the thoughts and the feedback that you all had about how we get this across the finish line. This is not something that we can do on our own here in this building in the United States Capitol. It's not even something that we can do on our own with our stakeholder community here in Washington, DC. The way that we are going to get the amount of us signed into law is with the energy and in the enthusiasm and the mobilization and the activation of engaged Americans across the country. That's the only way it gets done. And you heard from so many of the speakers talk about the need for a Senate strategy. There are so many people who assume when they hear the phrase Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act that it doesn't apply to them. Members of the United States Senate who tune out as soon as you say that phrase because they assume that it's applying to someone else, that their support's not needed, that their vote's not needed, that their engagement is not needed. That could not be further from the truth. And so I believe that we can get this done. I believe we can get it across the finish line this year, but I want you to hear me say this so clearly. We cannot do it without you. And so thank you for coming, but also for the commitment that you're making <laughs> to help us get this done. Now, um, you've also heard from a variety of panelists and speakers today talking about federal funding. Now, some of you are here um, from industry, some of you are here from agencies, but some of you are here from organizations that may not have ever previously received federal funds. We are on the cusp of passing legislation to the tune of $1.3 billion, billion with a B, to offer an injection of funding into our communities. I want you to hear me say this, okay? We want y'all to get this money. Now, our interest in you all receiving these awards and the reality of groups, providers, researchers pulling together competitive applications where they receive the award, I understand, are two very different things, okay? And so think of this next session the appropriation session and the federal grant making session as prep. The Black Maternal Health Caucus is committed to working with you all, this larger community, to help ensure that these resources can get into the communities that we all serve, okay? And this is just the first step. And so I'm really excited now to introduce Congresswoman Rosa, Rosa DeLauro, or who I call Madam Chair, who, and she is now the ranking member of our House Appropriations Committee to provide remarks. Now, as many people in this know, ranking member Rosa DeLauro proudly represents uh, Connecticut's third congressional district, and she has been a steadfast champion for women, children, and families across the country for decades. Under her leadership as chair of the Appropriations Committee, we secured historic funding increases for the critical maternal health programs that you've heard described today, and we have delivered unprecedented investments to communities in every state in America. It has been my true joy and honor to serve on the Appropriations Committee under Chairwoman DeLauro, and I am honored to introduce her remarks today, and then we will receive a panel, and I just want to say thank you so much to these panelists for joining us. Thank you. Hi, this is Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro, representing Connecticut's third district. Congresswoman Underwood, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak at the Black Maternal Health Caucus 2023 Stakeholder Summit. I know that you and your staff have been working so hard to make this happen and I only wish I could be there with all of you in person. Congresswoman Underwood has been an incredible leader in the Congress 
for advocating for maternal health. Since coming to the Congress in 2018, she has worked tirelessly to make sure that our policy and our federal investments improve the lives of the most vulnerable. I am proud to be an original co-sponsor of Congresswoman Underwood's Black Maternal Health Mamabus uh, and a member of the Black Maternal Health Caucus, which the Congresswoman uh, and Congresswoman Alma Adams have founded. We are also very fortunate to have Congresswoman Underwood and her expertise on the House Appropriations Committee. A thank you to everyone here, the advocates, for working so hard every day to enhance the health of our nation's mothers and their children. The work you do to advance maternal health priorities is so important because we know study after study has shown, and I know from watching my own grandchildren, that good health and nutrition in the first thousand days of a child's life is particularly critical. The maternal mortality rate in this country, especially among black and brown women, is unacceptable and frankly appalling. We know how critical maternal health is and we need to ensure that our policy and investments reflect this so that our children have the chance to be everything that they can be. So I have been proud to support your efforts over the years. Nothing we do is as important as making sure that the next generation has what they need to thrive and to be able to reach their full potential. Soon you will hear from Laurie McNone my staffer on the Appropriations Committee, about how you can use your voice and platform to advocate for maternal health priorities through the appropriations process. When I first came to the Congress, I wanted to join the Energy and Commerce Committee because they focused on health care. However, it was David Obey who advised me to join the Appropriations Committee, and I soon found that serving on the committee that directs government funding was a place that I could really make a difference. And together, with your help, we have made a difference. I'm so proud that during the four years that I served as chair of the House Appropriations, Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education Subcommittee, the portfolio of programs that address maternal mortality increased more than 40%. That's $3.7 billion in funding over the last four years. These are historic investments in programs that promote equitable and safe maternal and infant health, focused on improving the lives of women, children, and families. We need to continue to build the national infrastructure for maternal mortality prevention. Women need to be listened to and appropriately served when they seek care. These programs change and save lives. In a time when families face rising costs, these programs help ensure that millions of American mothers and children have access to the health and nutrition they need to thrive. Unfortunately, as you may know, our friends across the aisle have been trying hard, very hard, to roll back the progress we have made. Your advocacy is crucial in helping explain to my Republican colleagues that cutting and in some cases, eliminating programs that help address maternal mortality is penny wise and pound foolish, particularly as working families face rising costs. Congress is an institution that responds to external pressure, and you are that external pressure through which meaningful change can be made. The reason we were able to make these important investments is because of you. Advocates are speaking out and letting their members of Congress know that maternal mortality must be addressed. We are hearing you and taking action, and that momentum must continue. I want to end by sharing two very important lessons that my late mother taught me. First, never give up. And second, never take no for an answer. And I know that all of you will never give up and as you fight for women and children across our country. Thank you.
Yeah, uh, thank you to ranking member Rosa DeLauro for those amazing remarks. To continue the conversation, I am delighted to welcome to the podium Lori Mignon, professional staff for the House Committee on Appropriations. Lori has been with the committee since January 2019 and specifically covers the Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education Subcommittee, where most of the key maternal health programs are funded. Lori, thank you so much for being here, and the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to be here, and it's a hard act to follow my boss, Rosa DeLauro. For those of you who know Rosa, you know her energy and her enthusiasm, and I am pleased that my career in public health and federal budget led me to work for her, and I'm honored to be here with you today. As stated, um, Rosa said that she, is, she knows that Congress responds to external pressure, and she strongly believes that. So let's talk a little bit about the appropriations process and how your voices can be heard and are being heard by Rosa and other leaders here on the Appropriations Committee. So um, as we've talked about, and you know there are two types of bills here in Congress. There's authorizing bills that establish, continue, or modify agencies and programs. And then there are the appropriations bills that I'm very biased about and I think are most important. And those are the bills that fund agencies and programs. Each year, the Appropriations Committee must prepare and uh, pass 12 different appropriations sub, uh, subcommittee bills. And as stated, most of the programs in HHS that focus in on maternal health are in the Labor, Health, and Human Services and, and Education Subcommittee. On the next slide, you'll see um, that this is both on the left side, the key members of this process, and I'm proud to say that this New York Times photo from earlier this year shows the key leaders in this process. For This is the first time that all women are in charge of this process. It begins with the delivery... <laughs> It begins with the delivery of the president's budget, which is prepared by the White House Office of Management and Budget. Shalonda Young, who is in the center of the photograph, is the director of OMB, and she's also formerly my boss, as she was the director of the House Appropriations Committee staff. On the left side, you see uh, Vice Chair Collins, Chair Murray, and on the Senate side, for the Senate, and on the right side of the photograph, you see the House leadership, which is Chair Granger and Ranking Member DeLauro. On the right side, it has some of the key points of the appropriations process. So the budget comes from the President, from Shalanda, to the Hill. This is an opportunity for you to engage. Please don't forget to engage with OMB. They will start their process shortly after Labor Day. It's really essential for you to try to meet with your OMB examiners. Don't forget them. It's essential to get into the president's budget. It's a really key part. And I say that as a former OMB examiner. Next, the budget comes to the Capitol Hill, and it becomes responsibility of the House and Senate to move through hearings and drafting the respective bills and reports. This is an essential time to engage. Although the window of opportunity often is short, it is really critical for you to engage with members of anyone in the House and in the Senate because the House and the Senate Appropriations Committee welcomes all of these members to submit requests each year. I'm unfamiliar with any other committee that welcomes these requests. In the 2024 process that we're running right now, Labor, HHS, and Education in the House side received 13,700 requests, of which 270 were for safe motherhood programs. Thank you to all of you who have taken the time to gut members to make these requests. And my, the next speaker, Rachel, will talk a little bit more about how to make this happen. I just wanna let you know that these requests matter, and I personally work through each of them as Rosa's staffer. You can imagine, and it won't be surprising, that Ranking Member DeLauro asks for the details of all of these requests. I must tell her who asked for what and what they are looking for. She asks who is looking for what priority, how we can address it, and how we can make the most each year happen. 
So this is a really essential step and a great opportunity for you to engage. We then move through subcommittee, full committee, and the floor. There's often amendments throughout that process. And then we move into conference and final passage. We never seem to do this at the same time each year, but we always get our work done. And that's another time for you to engage as well. And then hopefully we move the bill on to the president for signature and for it to become law. I just want to highlight that in my portfolio of Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, it was due to the significant member support for increases in safe motherhood and infant health programs at CDC that funding was increased. Over the past four years under ranking member DeLauro's leadership, CDC programs alone increased 86% for safe motherhood and infant health. This is because of your work and the leadership of uh, Congresswoman Underwood on the Appropriations Committee. We are very pleased that maternal mortality review committees were funded for the first time in 2019, and thanks to consistent funding increases, it became a national program last year. One success of the use of the data from the maternal mortality review committees is in my home state of Connecticut. I'm one of, I grew up, and I was one of Rosa's constituents before coming to Washington. It is now in Connecticut, they use the data from the MMRC to lead to the expansion and the extension of Medicaid-eligible pregnant and postpartum women for one year postpartum. This is just one example of the good work and the, what is happening because we can get these programs to be national programs. We're still working on perinatal quality collaboratives. We're still trying to get that increased funding to make that also be a 50 state, pro, um, to get the funding that all 50 states need. They each have it, but we need more to increase capacity and conduct additional initiatives. So these are just two of the many programs that we have within Labor H. Another way of getting engaged is through congressionally funded projects or congressionally directed spending otherwise known as earmarks. We don't have them this year in the House, but the Senate does have them. So they're not in CDC, but they're in HRSA. So there's another way to engage in our, in our process. The bottom line is, is that your voice matters. It's my job to know the appropriations process and to help you through it and then to, for it to become law. But it's your job to get your voice heard by, to the members so that they can be submitted and it can be engaged throughout the appropriations process. I will just quickly say that the outlook for 2024 is uncertain at this time. Um, in the House, all 12 bills um, have moved through subcommittee, 10 moved through full committee, and just last week um, we thought that Labor HHS might move to full committee, but it didn't. Um, so there's two bills that have not moved through full committee. That's Commerce, Justice, Science, and Labor, Health, and Human Services, and Education. One bill was considered by the floor, and the White House has issued a veto um, if to, that bill was to be moved through. The, the reality is quite different in the Senate. It's, it's unusual. The past four years, the Senate didn't move, or five years, the Senate didn't move 12 bills through, but they did. They've moved all 12 bills through committee. It's amazing that the Senate has been able to move to some type of regular order. Um, we're in recess right now, as you know, and the Senate is scheduled to return on September 5th, and the House will return on September 12th. But the new fiscal year will start October 1. And so we will need a continuing resolution, or we will be looking at a government shutdown. We need to continue to hear from you about the importance of moving appropriations bills through in regular order, and we need to continue our process so that we can move forward and get good things done and continue on the success that we've had for the past four years. I'll conclude there, and I look forward to taking questions after Rachel speaks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori, for sharing such valuable information. Uh, just to follow up on what she already shared with you guys, I want to remind you to please, please, please speak with your senators on these CPF projects. Talk to them about getting the funding, about the process, and everything that you need to do to make sure that these dollars end up in your hands. And while it is true that we do not have these earmarks in the House, um, 
due to Republican advocacy. Uh, the reality is, is that we hope to again one day. And so I really want you guys to be well versed in this process, to do everything you can in your power, to speak to those in power about making sure you get the funding for these projects. I would now like to introduce Rachel Tetlow, the Federal Affairs Director at the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, also known as ACOG. Rachel has been at ACOG for more than 11 years and has been an incredible partner to the Black Maternal Health Caucus. Rachel, I will invite you and turn it over to you now. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first, I want to say what an honor um, it is to be up here to uh, share the stage with so many amazing people who have already spoken today. Thank you so much to Congresswoman Underwood for having us here. Um, I, I'm really excited to talk to you about the appropriations process. Woo! Uh, so I don't know if I necessarily have any super secrets, but hopefully this will do a little bit of the demystifying. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about will be looking ahead for fiscal year 25, so thinking through some tactics uh, to employ going into the next year's process uh, starting in um, as early as January. So um, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is a, maybe a little bit of a how-to, a choose-your-own-adventure, if you will. There are a number of ways uh, to, to influence um, and get your requests in front of key members so that they get into the appropriators and ideally make it into the, the bill or the bill's report. And I do remember hearing early on, and I, you know, I've been doing this for, for a while, I've been with ACOG for over a decade and um, another organization before that, so I've been um, engaged in this process for about 15 years. There were earmarks when I started, then they went away, now they're back again, though, not really, but, but these things haven't really changed in that um, there are a number of ways to try to get your, your priorities included. And on our side of things, we don't always have all, uh, all all the information, so to speak. So some of it is um, taking a bit of a leap of faith, right? So I'm gonna start with su submitting forms. Um, and, and for those of you who have been around here for a while, this is not news to you, but um, I'll, I'll venture to say every member of Congress, uh, or m most of them, and, and uh, have um, appropriations forms that they post on their website. Some of them are hidden very well, uh, but, but they, um, have fo forms th through which you can submit re requests for either report l language or um, specific funding levels. And these forms require all different kinds of information. It's not a common application by any means. So it can be uh, a bit time consuming, but that is a great way um, to kind of start the process is uh, by picking and choosing key members who you think may be most interested um, and amenable to the requests that, you're, that, that you wanna make and start to fill out some of those forms. A lot of them ask for um, name and contact information for, for constituents, so if you have connections to that particular state or district, that, that always helps. They also wanna know how a particular request impacts their state or district, so having that in information and justification is really helpful as well. Um, as, as the history, of, if the request has been made before, it's good to note that. Um, or if it's brand new, that's also an exciting thing to share with them. Um, in addition to these, these forms, because I'll, I'll say uh, members of Congress each have kind of a set n number of requests that they can make through the appropriate to, to the Appropriations Committee. Um, and we, on our side of things, don't always know if our asks make it onto that list. It's very competitive um, and we, we don't know if a member adds us to their list or not unless they tell us. And so uh, in addition to submitting the forms, we also want to think through the different ways that we can try to leverage the process. So one is, of course, to meet with key staff, especially if you're gonna submit a form to a particular office. It's a great opportunity to go and meet with that office. Um, it's, it's much easier than it used to be now as well, that you don't have to be in DC to meet with offices. It's, it's, it's really made the process um, so much easier for folks who are not based in DC to engage in a meaningful way in, the, in, in this appropriations process. So meet, meet with key staff, give, that gives you an opportunity to make your case beyond just what's on paper. Uh, you can also um, 
get together with your friends, with fellow organizations, and um, put together a coalition letter, a letter from your collective organization sent to uh, the Appropriations Committee making you, your case advocating for inclusion of your particular language. Uh, and showing that s strength in numbers is always helpful as well, uh, especially if your coalition partners also submit those requests to those same offices with those forms. Uh, it can also be helpful to have a member letter. So um, members of Congress who have committed um, to supporting the request that, that you have, work with them on a letter that they send out to their colleagues to sign on to then submit to the Appropriations Committee. That and all of these things together, or b some, or but definitely all, can, de can, can work towards helping to make your case uh, to get your priorities included. Next slide. I only have two slides. This is my last slide. Okay, so um, as as part of your your to do list that everyone should should consider um, as you're looking ahead to the FY25 appropriations process and thinking through the requ the requests that you may want to make, doing your homework, really basic, right? Understanding what has been included in those um, appropriations reports previously. Has there been something similar that you can build off of? Um, has a language been included before? Or, and if it hasn't, that's also okay, but knowing that information before you embark on the process is gonna be really helpful. Understanding the relevance to um, the state or congressional district is also really important. Um, and I'll get to an example in just a moment of, of how that comes into play. Building your coalition, of course, having s strength in numbers, um, multiple organizations making the same request is going to show you know, that there's a lot of support for this among the advocacy community. And of course, pounding the pavement, which can mean a lot of different things now, right? Um, so getting your, your request in front of key members doesn't have to mean coming up to Capitol Hill anymore. You, you can um, schedule those meetings virtually, um, and I always recommend trying to meet with as, as, as many key members as possible to get your requests in front of them. And since Lori mentioned um, the Maternal Mortality Review Committee uh, funding, one interesting th thing about that, and we should absolutely be keeping in mind with the Momnibus work, is that you know it takes a long time um, sometimes to get legislation passed, right? We're working on over multiple Congresses, and we're not gonna take our foot off the gas there, but we can also look to the appropriations process for how we can find bits and pieces that we may be able to, to advance through that process while we're also working on the authorizing language. Uh, for, for example, with, um, the, Maternal with the, the Preventing Maternal Deaths Act, before that passed in 2018, uh, we were successful in getting funding included in the appropriations bill. And so that actually meant that once the bill was signed into law and we had the authorizing language, we didn't have to wait another appropriations process before the bill could be actually implemented. We already had that funding so we could really hit the ground running and make even more of an impact. So now that we're in the process of reauthorizing that bill, we have even more great data coming out of the implementation of that program because we had that funding before the bill was even signed into law. So um, I cannot overstate the power of the, uh, and, and the possibilities of the appropriations process. Even in a divided Congress, um, there are opportunities for us to move these, um, these priorities forward. Um, so I think I'll, I'll pause there and then I'll see if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Rachel and Lori. Um, it looks like at this time we have enough time for at least one question. Um, so if any questions about the appropriations process came to mind while Lori or Rachel were speaking, now might be a good time for you to ask. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I'm Melody Reese with Moms Clean Air Force, and I just had a quick question. I think both of you mentioned maybe meeting with uh, key members of Congress, and I'm wondering if you can provide some guidance on who would be key members. Would it be members where you have constituents? Would it be members who are on the appropriate subcommittees of the Appropriations Committee? Would it be meeting with staff from the Appropriations Subcommittee or a full committee? If you could provide any guidance, that would be great. I would say all of the above. And that's not a joke because I, as this committee staffer, a lot of folks skip over me, but I think it's really great to have these meetings. And as Rachel highlighted, 
I'm really happy to do them remotely because we can get people from all over the country, often all over the world, and we can do the meeting in 15 minutes and it's really efficient. And so I think that's really important. Um, what I will say is that you want to think about, on the Appropriations Committee, I would prioritize your list to members of the Appropriations Committee and then the subcommittee. Although every member of the House is um, welcome to re make requests, we do try and satisfy members of the committee as much as we can first, and then we look to it. But I think you need to prioritize your strategy, but I would say that all of these meetings matter, and constituent meetings are really often the most successful when you're meeting with a member, but with someone like me, everyone is the constituent. Would have said the same thing. I think um, identifying, of course, with the the members on the subcommittee, um, those are going to be the folks who are most familiar with with the programs and and and, and the bills. But especially, you know, with um, uh, the members of the Black Maternal Health Caucus, for instance, have have made it known by their membership that they are incredibly interested in in these issues. And so, even if they aren't on on committee. Um, they may be, it may make sense to target those members as well. It looks like, oh yes, of course. Oh, don't wait. oh yeah, don't, don't wait until March to have those conversations that, right, yeah. Um, so um, those, those conversations can, can really happen at any time. Um, and I, I would say that things start, start to heat up and schedules fill up <laughs> quite a bit um, as you get into the late winter, early spring. Um, so, so if if you have proposals early, it, you don't have to wait until until you start to hear of the deadlines coming, um, because that's when it's a mad rush and it can be really hard to get someone's a, a full attention on on your priority issue. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Right here. Sorry. Oh. Um. We're bringing you a mic, so you don't have to yell. <laughs> Hi, Sam Hewitt, American Nurses Association. Um, every year we get sent letters by large coalitions asking us to sign on to their appropriations letters, and it gets to the point where it gets into the hundreds almost, and we worry about putting our name on everything that we do care about. Do you find that both your staffs as well as the staff on the other side of the aisle pay attention to those letters, or do they pay attention more to what their members are telling them to support? The, mem the letters certainly matter, and I encourage folks to continue the letters, but I will say that I spend the most time dealing with the member requests that are submitted through the system, because those are the formal requests that each member has prioritized, and therefore that is their official on record requests that they'd like to see. And under ranking member DeLauro's leadership, we had to be responsive to every member of the House um, to say how we met their requests. So I would encourage you to be um, judicious in the letters you sign on to, but spend a great deal of time trying to get members to make the request into the system. And I will highlight and say, this is not a sophisticated system. It is, um, this is an output that I get in the Excel worksheet, 13,700 rows. And so it's, it's, this is not the most advanced thing. The key piece is saying that you want the Department of Health and Human Services, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Safe Motherhood and Infant Health Line, and this is the line you're looking for. This is the amount you're looking for, and this is the language you're looking for. Same thing for HRSA, all the other agencies. So you just, the most simple things that you need so that the staff in the member office can correctly submit it, because then I also spend a great deal of time trying to figure out what the request is for. So um, member requests matter a great deal. Thank you.